Thank you for the introduction. So, um, so the title of my talk today is Ensuring Quality of Large-Scale NGS Data. So I will focus on the, um, the how to ensure the, why we have the clean data and what is the sample level quality control and what is the sequence level quality control and those things. So um, start. So first, um, so there are many use for the NGS, next generation sequencing data, and one of the um, most common application, and I, as I work working in the human genetics, I, um, the most common usage for me is the genetic association study. So let's say, um, so in this simple cartoon, um, this is a very simple, simplified example, we wanna find out whether a specific genotype is associated with the mice a weight or not. So here we have um, a biallelic genotype, which um, some mice have AA, some mice have CC genotypes, and some of them have heterozygous genotypes, which is CA here. And if we align them, um, if, we, if we classify them based on their genotype, and if we observe their phenotype, and mapping genotype-phenotype associations is what we wanna do to find out whether this genotype plays a role in this mice weight or not, and in this case, we see um, there is no statistical difference between the CC genotype mice and AA genotype mice. So in this case, the association would not, would not be significant. And surely, if there is a clear um, trend that AA genotype mice have higher weight than the CC genotype mice, then we say the association is significant. So surely, we do some more rigorous statistical tool. And how to do this in large scale, in whole genome scale, is finding significant association across large set of markers. Here we say um, there are M markers across the whole genome, and if we have N samples, in, and both M and, M, M and N are very large here. We are speaking of thousands or tens of thousands of samples, and also millions of markers usually in, in terms of whole genome. If we have this genotype matrix, this bin matrix, and if we have the vector of phenotype, then we um, typically we do um, in this case the um, quantitative traits we do regression analysis for binary traits we can do logistic regression or other types of tests and if we find a specific beta that is um, that deviates significantly from our null expectation then we say we found this candidate marker for the um, this specific phenotype so the question is that how to find this genotype matrix and um, we have about three billion bases in human, and we are seeking to ensure our statistical power in large-scale population study. We, in, um, we don't have at least thousands of samples, and sometimes the meta-study, we are speaking about hundreds of thousands of samples. And 
since like um, 2005, there this GWAS study has gained popularity, which was um, utilizing the anchor markers across the whole genome. So they had like um, from 100,000 to about a couple of million markers across the genome. So they have pre-specified set of markers across the genome, and they genotype all these markers. And um, it costs like, these days it costs about $100 per sample. Sometimes it costs more or less based on what kind of genotyping solution you are using. And recently, um, because of the emerging NGS technologies, the sequencing gets more to, uh, much cheaper. So we can obtain the full sequence information without um, uh, much difficulties. In this case, the whole exome sequencing is um, obtaining almost all protein coding regions of the DNA, which is about 1% of the whole genome. And it, these days, it costs about $500 to $1,500 per sample. Um, and usually, this exome sequencing, it, because the target region is just 1% of the genome, you can sequence deeper than usual whole genome sequencing. So obviously, the next, um, the, the more desirable setting is this whole genome sequencing. In this case, we are obtaining all the genotypes on all of the bases, almost all of the bases. There are some non-reachable regions in the genome, but usually we, we, we think it's the whole genome. And um, it's the full genotype matrix on every base of um, human DNA. And still, it costs um, much more than exome sequencing or genotyping, but it's, it's, it's declining very fast. So these days, the lower bound is about $1,000 per genome for whole genome sequencing. And still, most of the cases, it costs like $5,000 per genome. And this is the um, illustration of um, how fast the cost of sequencing is decreasing. So probably you have seen this multiple times. So it's decreasing faster than Moore's law since the, um, human, the first human genome project. So in 2001, um, Francis Collins and Craig Venter, they sequenced the entire human genome with about $100 million. And it was just a single genome. But since the introduction of the next generation sequencing, it decreased much faster. And as of today, this, this is the Illumina's um, high stick 10 machine. And it sequenced about um, the whole genome with 30, 30x coverage with just a slightly over $1,000. And if we sequence the whole exome on this high stick 10 machine, the exome sequencing is still not possible for this high stick 10 because of their policies. But if it's possible, we can see sub $100 per exome sequence. So what, it, what does it mean? What does the lower cost mean? It means um, it enables we can sequence more samples with the same amount of money. So it means um, the whole genome with about 40x coverage, it, um, in compressed format, it takes about 200 gigabytes per a single sample. So just to store 10,000 samples, which is kind of the um, typical size for these days large scale sequencing project, it, just to store them, it takes two petabytes of storage. And to, to process these, this amount of information, we need a lot of parallel computation. And we need a lot of computing power and a lot of storages. So um, this is, has been already um, like five years ago. But there was this um, famous paper, like $1,000 genome, but the $100,000 analysis, which means the analysis burden is increasing because the cost of sequencing is decreasing. So there are several challenges in next generation sequencing. Surely I'm, I, I cannot um, present all of those topics. So I will focus on the um, first of few steps, like um, the in vitro problems, which is the, um, the NGS data. Um, is, it, it's high throughput. It's very, um, it generates data very fast, but it's error prone compared to traditional Sanger or, or other longer read sequencing technologies. There are more base read errors than true variations in, in, in your sequence. So distinguishing errors from the information is pretty important. So there are in vitro problems such as PCR amplification errors. And there are um, DNA sample contaminations. So you, you, um, your, your DNA gets mixed uh, even at a very small proportion. And, and it gets problematic in, in, in the later analysis stages. And there are also in silico problems due to um, imperfect algorithms to process these data. And um, especially, there are a lot of mapping and alignment artifacts. Um, and there are also many, many false positive variants, which is not actually really truly the genome variation. 
So I will focus on these two topics, and the first half of my talk is the how to how do we um, estimate and correct for DNA sample contamination in NGS sequencing data. So DNA sample contamination is a very common problem. Um, I took this picture from the um, actually forensic science. So this this woman here is collecting the DNA sample and sneezing over it. So certainly in this case, it's, it's contaminated. But uh, this is an extreme case. Usually in, in your lab environment, this wouldn't happen. But in smaller scale, it, 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 it's still a very common problem. So DNA sample contamination is pretty common. It's, it's um, more common than you might think. And it's a very serious problem. So timely feedback. And because it, it's a serious problem, because usually it happens in batches. And if, when it happens in batches, it's worse. And, and when there is a protocol change um, and they don't know there was a problem in their protocols, so it, uh, I'll explain it with a real example later. So exact estimation and correction is it, we, we could save terabytes and sometimes petabytes of data. So we, can, we developed an in silico approach that solves this in vitro problem. So again, um, present this simplified cartoon here. Um, so this is a very simple, simplified version of reference sequence and a mapped and aligned sequence data. So we have a, a reference genome, five prime to three prime. And here we have this sample of interest. And we, we align these reads against the reference genome with the highest mapping score. And then we identify which part of this sample differs from the reference genome. This is how we call the um, SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. So here, the reference genome it has a base A, but the, um, this sample has heterogeneous genotype. This one has GA. And in some other location, the reference has the base C. But um, looking at the reads, it's, it's highly likely that this sample have a homozygous alternative genotype of AA. So in case of clean data, it's simple. And when you have multiple samples, we see how different individuals have different genotypes. And at some location, they share the same variations. And at some location, it's just unique to the specific sample. So we see also homozygous types, and we see also heterozygous types. But what happens if these two samples are mixed? So, um, let's, so this is a um, extreme contamination. These samples are mixed one to one. In this case, we see all of the variations. But in some of the locations, like um, one sample is homozygous reference, one sample is heterozygous, so we see um, the um, increase of, uh, actually, we are seeing increasement of the heterozygous genotype compared to the homozygous because of the mixture strength. So how to estimate this is estimate um, how much the sample is contaminated is modeling this distribution, deviates from what is expected from the heterozygous and homozygous genotype. So that is the whole idea behind this um, formulation. So we, um, when we call these SNPs, um, usually we model the genotype likelihood. So genotype likelihood, what is the likelihood of observing AAAA conditioned on underlying genotype is AA or under, underlying genotype is um, um, GA. So here, these bi genotypes are, are um, generally denoted as AAAB or BB genotypes. So, um, and by looking at multiple markers, and we can model the overall, the joint likelihood of, of observing these set of bases across M markers by, multiple, um, by simple um, multinomial model. So here, the likelihood of each marker, these are considered to be independent with, with each other. So just the um, product of these individual likelihood is the overall likelihood. But in case of contamination, the likelihood is not um, a single product, but it's sum of two samples. So here we are assuming a, um, the basis we are observing is result of a mixture from two samples. So here we are denoting the contamination parameter, the mixing proportion as alpha. So it parameterized by alpha, this likelihood of alpha is given by observing a set of bases assuming genotype of a original sample. 
and observing the um, set of bases given the genotype of the contaminating sample. So this is the foreign source. And here these two um, probabilities are mixed with missing proportion alpha. So it, this one has one minus alpha and this one has alpha proportion in the base. And we marginalize it because we, um, and here, note that this genotype likelihood, likelihoods are conditioned on the known genotypes, but we don't know the true genotype of contaminating samples, so we marginalized over all the possible genotypes of the contaminating sample. And this assumption, here we are assuming that we know the genotype of the original sample, but in, if we don't know the genotype, without, um, if we don't have any additional information, then we marginalize once over all the possible genotypes. And we numerically estimate which value of alpha maximizes this likelihood. And that alpha is the, um, the contamination parameter we are looking for. So um, that was kind of a, a, a simple um, um, formulation of the likelihood parameters. So we um, developed a software that um, estimates these alpha, alpha levels for the um, contaminated samples, and we simulated um, this contaminated um, sequence data by mixing randomly mixing two samples with a certain mixing proportion, and we compared um, the intended level of contamination by um, intentionally mixing these two samples, and what is the estimated level of alpha that's estimated by our likelihood model, and it cor um, correspond pretty well to the intended levels. And here is the 1% contamination, so which means every hundreds of original, um, hundred reads of the original sample, we have one read from a foreign sample. And at the level of one, at the level lower than 1%, it has a little bit dispersion, so it, sometimes it underestimates than the intended alpha, sometimes it overestimates, but above the 1% level, it corresponds to the um, intended contamination parameter pretty well. So we can say that this um, model works pretty well for the um, small to moderately contaminated samples. And here the, these different panes A and B are, A is when we know the genotypes of the contaminated sample. B is, we don't know anything about these two sample genotypes. We marginalize over all possible cases, all possible combinations of genotypes, and it still works pretty well. And the concordance between A and B method is, is pretty high. So with this likelihood model we applied, actually the reason we developed this model is in this um, large scale type two diabetes sequencing study. Here we um, sequenced about 2,800 whole genome sequences. And we not noticed something was wrong. Um, this, these samples were sequenced back in 2010 and 2011. And here, since here we are seeing the increased level of heterozygosity. And in the previous cartoon, I explained why the heterozygosity increases if the sample is contaminated. So we suspected of contamination, developed this likelihood model and applied it. And we so we estimated the levels of contamination and we identified it happened, they changed the sequencing protocol in some time in this area. And we, we reported it back and they corrected their protocols. And before, before doing that, they had um, about, they have about one to 5% of contamination here. But after they fixed their, their, their protocols, we saw almost no contamination at all. So, so this was very successful example. And there were some samples that was largely contaminated. These were resequenced. So um, no contamination after a protocol change. So we solved our problem here um, just for a while. Um, so we have another example. Is This is not whole genome sequences, but the whole exon sequencing. We had um, about 13,000 samples 13,000 samples exome sequenced for also for the type 2 diabetes studies, and some of them are from actually Texas. We are sequencing San Antonio and Star County Mexican American data, and we have these multi ethnic samples from all across the world. And here, um, unfortunately, so some of the batches were very significantly contaminated, and the <coughs> amount of contamination was much worse than, than the previous case. Here, more than 23% of 13,000 samples 
had 3% or higher estimated contamination. So we usually think above 3%, we, we reject the sample in our normal protocol. So this was the threshold used in the Thousand Genomes project. But in this case, we had to resequence 23% of these samples. We had to resequence several thousand samples. We, um, so we simulated um, with various levels of contamination, what is the, the information loss we are having. <clears throat> so here in this plot, the x-axis is how deep we sequence, because these are whole exome sequences. They are deeply sequenced more than 50x. And the y-axis here is the non-reference concordance. So for um, whole exome sequences, we expect about 98, at least 98, 99% of concordances. But with just 5% of contamination, we are seeing significant drop in the non-reference concordance levels in the genotypes. And with 10% contamination, it was even, even worse. It, it never reaches 95% concordance, even at 50x. And when it was um, contaminated like 20%, when the contamination is more significant, actually sequencing deeper gives you worse accuracies. Because sequencing deeper means that you are kept with, with high levels of contamination. You are not just getting your um, sample of interest. You are also getting the contaminating source more, more deeper. So it, it, it alters the genotype more significantly. So this was a big problem. So it, so usually um, with lower levels of sequencing, sequencing deeper helps, but with, with, with high contamination, it doesn't help or it makes things worse. So here we developed, we modified our algorithm to model the, um, the contamination parameters. We, we used it for genotype calling. So when we call genotypes, when, if we know the, how, how the sample is contaminated, how much the sample level of contamination, then we can adjust our formula for the genotype likelihood, then we have better genotype calling. So here, um, we, we estimate um, the, again, we use the same formula for the um, overall likelihood model, but we, when we pick the genotype for, for genotyping, we select the genotype then max, not just the alpha levels, but also we select the genotype then maximizes modified formula accounting for the contamination. And by doing that, um, we corrected the mo low level of contamination pretty well. It's reaching about 100% um, concordance. And for 10% contamination, we are also reaching almost perfect. Well, but, and even with this significant level of contamination, it reaches about 98%. So it's, um, it works pretty well with, with this exome sequencing data. So we apply this contamination correction method to the, um, this exome data until all the significant contaminated samples are resequenced. It took about a year to do that. So before that, we did these analysis to rescue the data and have the results one year earlier than, than it was possible before. So, um, so this was simulation. And this is the real application on the, the actually contaminated samples. And in real scenarios, it, surely it works, um, doesn't work as well as the simulation cases. But for moderately, sequence, moderately contaminated samples, like up to 10 to 15 percent, we are, um, we, we have um, much higher genotype accuracy than it was, it was before. So the, here, the x-axis is the genotype concordance before the adjustment, and the y-axis is the genotype concordance after the adjustment. And the colors denote the level of contamination. So um, this diagonal line would be the, um, the be so we are rescuing the data from the diagonal up to this point. So that's the increasement we are getting in the genotype concordances. And also we are seeing um, now the back to normal head to home ratios, which means the, head, the level of heterozygous, uh, the amount of heterozygous compared to homozygous SNPs. So when it was not adjusted, we are seeing increased level of heterozygosity based on the contamination. But after the adjustment, we are seeing this flat head to home ratio. So this software um, is available for public use, and actually now it's being used by um, m most of the large scale sequencing projects I know. And there are two different software. I didn't explain this, um, the intensity part, but it's used for genotype array data. 
So when you have the general typing array, we can also estimate the contamination in the, for the array data, and we have this verified BAM ID software for the estimation of contamination levels in the sequence data. And this result, for the estimation and for the correction, these two results are all published in the American Journal of Human Genetics. And that was the um, first half. And now we are we removed all the contamination, so hopefully we can call better genotypes. So I will explain the second part of my talk, which is the efficient and scalable software pipeline for large-scale sequence data. And here we are talking about genotype calling and variant discovery. So we, um, the variant discovery in NGS data is we need a software pipeline for large-scale NGS data. So the purpose is from we um, is extracting the list of variants from the raw sequence data, and we require high throughput massive parallelization software to, to process these um, thousands of samples in, in, in reasonable time. And we also need, because when we have more samples, the errors also um, accumulate, so we need effective filtering strategies to filter out the false variations. And, but still, we want to maintain the high sensitivity. We don't want to throw um, valuable information. And <clears throat> for these type of population level sequences, we typically employ the multi-sample genotyping. So instead of processing each sample separately or processing them batch by batch, processing them all together to um, model the, multi the population level um, allele, allele frequencies, it gives us better sensitivity and also it provides information for effective, more effective filtering. So I'll explain um, what is the pipeline um, consist of. So um, we call this pipeline genomes on the cloud, and, and as an abbreviation, we call it um, GOT Cloud. And it includes actually all the softwares from mapping and alignment to the um, haplotype-based phasing. And but this. In mapping and alignment part, we use BWA aligner, and we can plug in whatever alignment software you want to use. And we do the standard BAM um, sample level QCs, which is the remove the duplicate reads, and we do genotype um, uh, based, based read quality recalibration. So we have this mapped and refined data, and we run this contamination checking software I just mentioned. And I will start from here. So we start with clean um, BAM file, which is the sequence data mapped and aligned. And from there, we generate the genotype likelihood file. So this is a two-step approach. And from this genotype likelihood file, we do <coughs> genotype um, the list of variants. And this variants uh, list contain a lot of false positives. So we filter them with various features from the sequence data using a support vector machine classifier. And that's what we get as the final product of this variant calling pipeline. And for whole genome data, we do one more step, which is the haplotype-based refinement with, to get the better um, phase genotypes with higher accuracies. So I'll explain this um, briefly. And I will explain first what is the false positive variance. So in the sequence data, um, even though the error rate is pretty low for today's um, up-to-date sequencing machines, still there are many artifacts, especially, um, and it is um, associated with lower mapping quality, which means there are many mismatches in, in a specific read compared to reference genomes. Or when it gets to the end of the read cycle, then it um, has a lot of errors. And in this specific example, this is a um, software called IGB, which is the Integrative Genome Viewer, which is, you can, you can, it's a Java application you can publicly download. And in this example, this is a, a real sequence data from Dalton Genomes Project. And here it looks like there is a SNP. So um, there is this T multiple occurring multiple times at this specific locus, but it, it exists only in the reads with, in, colored in gray. And here, colored in gray means it has lower mapping quality. It has mapping quality less than um, 20. And when you see this kind of correlation that the alternative allele exists only in lower mapping quality reads, you suspect it's not a real variation. You suspect it's an artifact. And another example is that here, um, we, are, we, we see these two copies of alternative allele. 
but all the reads that contains this TLL has a deletion here. So this might be also a mapping artifact, or maybe these two variants are in perfect LD. But here, this all the other reads, these have G genotypes and these two have deletions. So it's, it, it could be also mapping artifacts. So these types of information, when it is collected across multiple samples, it can say um, um, it works pretty well as a false positive filter. So how to good, tell good from bad, this is one example, is when we have a heterogeneous genotype, same as in the contamination example, we, we expect 50-50 distribution of the reads because humans have two strands of DNA. And here, this sample, um, it seems like this sample has a heterogeneous genotype, C and T, and the allele fraction of the reference allele, T allele is 60% or 0.6. And here, this sample, it also has C and T, but it has 80% um, <coughs> at some other part of the genome. So it seems like this one is worse, right? So it, um, so it seems like this one is a true SNP. This one may be just a random error. But it's hard to tell when, um, usually it's not this clear. Usually it's, it's hard to set a specific threshold based on just a single sample. But when you look at across multiple samples, here, if you look at just this single sample, these two have the same 0.67 fraction of a reference alleles. But if you look at across multiple samples who has um, an alternate alias, this one has overall reference, um, reference fraction of 75%, which is um, pretty significant deviation from the 50% the expected 50%, but in this case, the left sample, if it, after looking at all the, <coughs> the other samples, we have LA balance of 56%, which is not a significant deviation. So by looking at multiple samples, you can say whether there is some systematic um, bias at a specific lo locus or not. So. And there are multiple of such features we, that tell us the quality of a variance. And first of all, we, um, surely we look at the sequencing depth. And if a variance is covered in inconsistently lower sequencing depth, which means it's, it's either hard, hard to map area or that part of the genome is hard to reach. And, <coughs> or, <coughs> and also we measure um, from the genotype likelihood, we measure the genotype confidence by which is marked in as quality. And the core rate is how many of samples have the, the missing genotypes or have, and this is actually related to the um, average sequencing depth, but it is possible that some samples have difficulties in, in genotype calling in a specific area. So if you have a lower core rate in some of the variants, it has lower quality. And the allele balance is the, um, just the example I just described. And there is also strand bias, which means if you see a different allele, so in sequencing, you have forward and reverse trend based on um, the, the, the direction of your read. So you can read the genome from, five, um, from forward to, to, um, to backward or backward to forward in, in complementary um, allele um, basis. So if a um, alternative allele exists only on the positive trend or only in the re, um, reverse trend, then in that case, we suspect something strange is going on there. So it's either um, an artifact or it could be um, ex existence of some more complex variations, not just a SNP. So we can, we can um, tell they're, they're, those variants would have lower quality. And the cycle bias is that correlation of, so I, I said there are more errors at the end of the reads because the, in, in NGS you're actually attaching a, a, a fragment of DNA to your um, your um, your base, and then you read <coughs> one base <coughs> at a time, and you wipe it off, and you read the next base. So as you repeat the process, um, your your um, accuracy goes down. So that's why we have a short, such a short read in NGS data. But when you observe these um, SNPs only at the end of the base, um, those reads, which means it 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 there is a higher probability that it, it's a result of an error. So, and there are many more features that we use for such purpose. The problem is that 
any of these um, single feature is not sufficient for filtering out first positives, so we want to combine these information to filter out the first positives. But if we cut out every problematic features, like you, you're, you're, you want to throw out the allele balance above a such, such level, and if, if you want to throw out um, the SNPs that has a strand bias higher than a certain level, you end up throwing out all these informations. <coughs> so, so one problem is there are too many thresholds that you have to specify, and the other problem is that you are throwing out too many. You are being too stringent. So we applied, um, we, to, to combine these different features, we applied a, a classifier, support vector machine classifier, and there's, there were a couple of advantages in this um, support vector machine approach because we don't know which SNPs are good and bad in beforehand. So we only select the extremely good ones from previously known sources, and we select also extremely bad examples from the um, SNPs that failing multiple of these hard filters. And, and when you have these extreme training examples, SVM um, works better than the other generative approaches because it maximizes the margin between the positive and um, negative classes. So <clears throat> we apply the SVM with the RBF kernel, and the effect on, of this filtering, um, we um, observed in multiple projects, and this data is from the um, type T2 D genes project two. Here we have family data, so we, we observed how many of the Mendelian inconsistencies are filtered out after the SVM based filtering. So here the filtering is done agnostic to the family structure, but it significantly um, decreased the um, amount of Mendelian inconsistencies in these pedigrees and before filtering, especially at the rare alleles, the singletons and doubletons, we see a lot of errors in singleton calling. So we are decreasing the error um, quite a bit. And we also experimented on the um, Dalton genomes data. And here we experimented both on the whole genome, they, um, whole genome sequence. And for the low pass genomes, we used chromosome 20 from the Dalton genomes. And we used the whole exomes. Um, and here the, um, the legends are, the solid lines are before filtering, before any kind of filtering. And the number on the y-axis is sensitivity, is how much of the exome, the variance that is verified by exome chip, we are discovering um, by our cooling pipeline. And here we are excluding all the omni SNPs because omni SNPs are used in the SBM training, so we, we ex uh, would exclude them for, um, to remove the confounding factors. But here, the thing is that the, the most, many of these exome chips, especially because the, um, the common genotypes are excluded, these are mostly rare variants. So in the rare variants, we are observing about 89% um, of sensitivity before filtering with 10, 10 samples. And as we have more samples, because multi-sample genotype polling works better for, um, for large samples, we are seeing um, the increasement in the sensitivity. We have about 94% before filtering. But with the hard filter, hard filter means using these LA balance filter, trend bias filter, they applying those filters separately. So it, it lowers the sensitivity quite a bit. But by applying the, um, the multi-feature strategy by super vector machines, we are achieving much higher um, sensitivity compared to the hard filtering. And we are approaching close to the um, the unfiltered sensitivity after removing many, many of the false positives. And here we compare the sensitivity analysis to the GATK's um, BQSR approach. And here, so I think these are, yeah, so these are the, ex these should be the exome data. Um, and here we compare the sensitivity um, to that of GATK and GATK applies a similar approach. They also apply the um, machine learning based approach for filtering, which is called BQSR. And compared to GATK, our God Cloud pipeline, it um, achieves better sensitivity oh. even after filtering, before and, and, and the after filtering. So after obtaining this clean set of variants, um, the next level, if you have the whole genome data, that the another step you can take is the haplotype aware genotype refinement. So this is based on the population um, 
genetics concept which people actually share blocks of genomes. So they, they share a fragment of their DNA. So when a person have a specific sequence of variants in their genome, and the other, there is other person that shares the same amount of <coughs> information. So your genome is not, it, it um, so when you look at the haplotype of your genome, then um, you can better infer one's genotypes. So this is especially helpful in case of the low pass sequencing because in low pass sequencing, you don't have enough coverage. So many, many, for many markers, we will actually have a missing genotype. And in that case, you can, you can fill in the missing information by looking at other people's haplotypes who have the same haplotype segments as the, the people who have the missing genotypes. And it also can correct a lot of errors. So I will not go into details, but for this, this step, we um, use a software called Beagle and also um, Thunder, which is um, typically used for um, haplotyping, phasing, and also for imputation. So after doing this post-processing for whole genome data, we see the, um, the overall genotype accuracy um, increases from the 90% um, to up to the 98%. Um, <coughs> And the um, interesting part here is when you have only 10 samples, the information gain, the accuracy gain obtained from this um, haplotype-based refinement is, is, is moderate. So you have about um, just a little bit more than 4% of accuracy increase here. But when you have 100 samples, it increases more. And when you have 1,000 samples, you, you gain much more. So by processing multiple samples together, you can find the segments that's shared by individuals more easily. So that's why you are gaining more accuracy here. And so we recommend using this haplotype-based refinement um, for the whole genome sequences. For whole exome sequences, because they are on the small chunks of the genome, it's much harder to achieve this type of um, post-processing step. And the next thing about, um, special about the GOT Cloud pipeline is the computational scalability. And so typically when you process um, multiple samples, for example, in GATK, it takes a one-stop parallelization approach. So you take um, multiple BAM files. So BAM1 is from a single um, a individual one, BAM2 is um, the second individual. You, because you cannot read these files into the memory at the same time, you take small chunks of the, um, the genome so you take usually five megabase pairs or, or even less. And then you look at this chunk of individual one, this chunk of individual two, this chunk of individual three, and then you get the list of variants only on this amount of the genome. And so the parallelization is on the chunks of the genome. So you divide the genome based on their um, chromosomal positions and then you achieve the parallelization. So this is a one-step approach. Here in our pipeline, we take a um, different approach, which is first we generate the genotype likelihood file by processing each sample separately. So we generate, um, still we, we divide up the, um, the chunks of the genome. So we, we generate a pile up for sample one, pile up for sample two, and this pile up is usually much abbreviated information than the raw sequence file. And from there, we generate um, a final set of variants. So we call variants from these pileups, not just from the raw vampires. So here the parallelization occurs in two places. First, when we generate the pileup for each sample and for each chunk, and then we can also parallelize in the genotype calling process based on their genomic positions. So in this two-step approach is much more um, efficient, especially for the um, deep se deeply sequenced data, because deep sequenced data, this vampire is much larger than the pileup, but the pileup size does not increase with the depth, sequencing depth. We are just looking at the um, aggregated information for a specific genomic position. So here is the, um, the runtime for the genome data, um, the um, low pass genomes and the deep sequence exomes and compared between the gut cloud and the GATK. And here we can see that um, with sample size more than several hundreds, the GATK runtime increased much rapidly than um, the GOT cloud case. 
and it the difference is even more significant for the deep deep axons um, because I as I explained the the amount of pileup it's um, much smaller in case of deeper sequence data and if you look at the peak memory usage for deep axon sequence data this is much more significant and <clears throat> The peak memory usage for um, marked in, in, in gigabytes, in God Cloud, it never goes above the one gigabytes, even with 1,000 samples. But in GATK, you need about seven gigabytes of memory. You might think this is not, seven gigabytes is not big, but when, usually in your servers or a virtual machine on your Amazon Cloud, when you have um, like 32 gigabytes of memory or 64 gigabytes of memory, this means this restricts the number of parallel sessions you can run in a single machine. So when you have more than 20 cores in a machine, but if you can run only 10 at a time due to the memory memory bottle, like it's, it's a problem. And so because of these computational scalabilities, it was used to call the um, genotypes for the thousands of samples processed together. And it was used in thousand genomes project. It was used in the T2D, um, Go T2D project. Um, the exon sequencing project, and another big chunk is the Sardinia, and we also did the type 2 diabetes, and genetics of type 2 diabetes project, and many more are in progress. So this pipeline is also um, public, public, publicly usable, and today I explained just for the SNP part, but now um, the pipeline is usable for inverse and structural variation to genotyping, and um, so open for public, and it can be installed on the Amazon Cloud or any other many, many popular um, cluster systems. And the, um, the method itself is pub um, just published in a couple of months ago in genome research. So, and that was the, um, um, my um, two topics on the um, NGS quality controls. And the, these are mostly completed projects. And nowadays I'm um, performing, my research is focused around two topics. One is the, um, the same in line with the today's talk, which is identification of complex variations. So we, I'm, I'm more focused these days on the structure variation calling and also assembly-based genotyping, not just mapping-based. And the other part is the traditional genetics of genetic association studies. So I, we, I am interested in role of the extreme rare variants in pedigrees. So that was um, that's a one of the projects that's ongoing. And we in human genetics center we are focused on the um, on the common disease. Um, and genetics of common disease like type 2 diabetes and related rates in Mexican-American pedigrees. There are many Mexican-American cohorts in, in Texas that we have the access to the sequence data. And um, Eric Borwinkle, who is a, one of the lead PI in the charge consortium project, we are processing um, more than 15,000 genomes and exomes in this project focused on the heart disease, coronary heart disease. And I'm also developing method to also not just the um, just simple genotype phenotype association, but also association with complex phenotypes, including um, epigenetic markers or the metabolomics and the microbiomes. So today, these days, we have um, very heterogeneous phenotype data, not just the um, simple quantitative or, or binary traits. So that's the um, the research I'm currently pursuing. And thank you for listening. Few minutes for questions. Yes. When you estimate the contamination, uh -huh. did you also take into consideration that in a given map of DNAs, when they go through the sequencing process, they might have a different, like for example, the amplification, you know, efficiency might be different, and those kind of factors? Um, so, you mean the sample is contaminated? Yeah. So um, like but for example, if have, uh, if it's one-to-one mix, right? So the DNA would go through the process, like, you know, um, amplified and then put on the, you know, the, the, the on the slide and then amplified and then the read. And, you know, right, so they... Uh, different amount of DNA, their amplification efficiency might be different. You know, those kind of factors. Right, so we are, um, actually the level of contamination we are estimating is after the amplification. So we, oh. it's not the... Um, so we cannot really tell which it the like we if we estimate ten percent which is originally it could have been like ninety five and five percent but it the, the, because of different level of amplification it might result as ninety percent and ten percent but 
we cannot really tell the difference just from this method. So these <coughs> Yeah. This is just on the, um, in silico, we just look at the sequenced product, final product.